The Real George Orwell Dreaming by Mike Walker with Joseph Milson as Eric Blair I'm not sure this is a terribly good idea. Now we come to it. Eric, I'm not sure it's a terribly good idea. You were all for it. We don't have to go on. No, no, I think it'll hold out if I'm careful. It? My voice, yes, you were... You were worried about my voice after the wound? About it lasting for a whole lecture? No. No? You know perfectly well what I'm worried about, Eric. Do I? You simply refuse to consider it in your usual pig-headed manner. Don't worry, darling. Not as if we're stepping into the stock exchange. These are our friends. Sometimes, Eric, for a brilliant man, you're a very stupid man. Uh, shall we go? Come on. <coughs> Summer, 1938. A time full of foreboding. I had come through the Spanish Civil War, but as to where I was going, where any of us were going in those dark days, no one knew. Can I introduce our speaker for tonight? A comrade who's returned from Spain, who was wounded there, and is well known as the author of many books on socialism and the state of England, and most recently his account of his experiences in the Spanish Civil War... Homage to Catalonia, Mr. Eric Blair. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Th thank you, brothers, sisters, comrades, for your invitation to talk here at this fine new building, the Conway Hall. Um, and I think it is appropriate that it was financed and built by the Ethics Society, since tonight I would like to talk about the ethical dilemmas I and many comrades experienced in Spain. Here it comes. Uh, <laughs> The, the backbone of the resistance against Franco was the Spanish working class. And this began with the anarchist trade union members of the CNT and in Catalonia the militias of the... In Catalonia the class traitors! Uh, yeah. uh, I, I can assure you, comrade, the fighters on the Zaragoza front were at the forefront of all... Fraternisation with the fascists! <laughs> no. Atrocities against the working <laughs> class! Betrayal yeah, yeah. of the yeah. communist yeah. ideas! If there was a, if there was a betrayal, yeah. comrade... Not if your comrade, you fascist <laughs> bastard! If, if, please, yeah. please, if there was a betrayal, it was by the communist... Communist Party of the Anarchist and Socialist Front in Catalonia. This please. <laughs> Comrades, Comrades, listen, listen to me, please, please. The May Days, the terror. They wouldn't listen. You wouldn't listen, <laughs> darling. You never do to what you don't want to hear. Is there to be no discussion? No conversation. Can you say in Spain? First we have to win the war, then we can talk about parties and factions and opinions. Oh. We lost the war. Now there's another war coming and we'll lose that one too and the whole of Europe will be... Uh, smoke? No, thank you. And you shouldn't either. It's not good for your throat. Oh, why would my throat matter? I have no voice. <laughs> I have nothing to say. I am an exponent of the art of silence. You're hurt because they wouldn't listen to you. But it's a free society. They don't have to, Eric. And, and that makes you angry. Like a schoolboy who's done his prep and stands up to recite his lesson and no one listens. Oh, the bounders, the rotten beasts. <laughs> You know, I walked over this bridge when I was on the tramp. I went to Lambeth, sold my clothes in a rag shop and got some others. You know, they were cleaner than the stuff we had in Spain. Here, here, have some of mine. Oh, my God, that's, that's six pennies of good back here. Where would you get all of that? I can tell you ain't been on the road long, Pilgrim. What, don't you get tobacco on the road, then? Of course we has it. Here, take a gander at this. Hmm? <laughs> Gotta keep a sharp eye in your head for doofers. Doofers? The doofer tomorrow. Ah, fag ends. I see. Why, I can pick up a couple of ounces a day, no trouble, off in the papers. Still, your backy is good backy. Fresh as cuckoo spit. <laughs> you don't mind if I roll a snow? Oh, uh, no, uh, go ahead. Oh, uh, wait, wait now. Hmm? 
Here's a fella looks promising. <coughs> Sir! <coughs> Sir! Could you spare a penny for a poor man who wants a cup of tea? I was a veteran. I, I, I was just, just, a, just a penny, sir. Maybe you should spend your money on tea and food and not waste it all on tobacco. All right, well then, I got that wrong. So, what do you think, Tommy? Should you? No, here's how I see it, Pilgrim. Would you deny a man a little comfort? Didn't Jesus is very self see Man does not live by bread alone. Uh, he'd have wanted a smoke, hanging there on that cross all day long. Uh, any man might. And, and you ask me, it's us that needs it more than the likes of him. Well, doesn't he have everything, and what do we have? Oh, what do you have, Tommy? Why do you do it? <sighs> oh, that's good backy, that is. Come on, I know's a place where they gives you a free bun and a mug of tea, and it's good tea and all, and you ask me, a smoke and decent cover, that's a good day. Yeah. Come on, Pilgrim. A smoke and a good cup of tea. A good day. I've lost it, Eileen. Whatever I found then, I don't know, the heart of England? Maybe that's what I thought it was. I thought it meant something. Doesn't it? It did to Tommy. That's, that's the thing. That's the, the thing. Tommy died in, in Spain. Tommy and thousands like him betrayed because they forgot to be content with a good smoke and a decent cup of tea because they wanted to build Jerusalem in Barcelona and Lambeth and they ended up with a, a, a handful of ashes. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was a girl and I lost something... Mummy always used to say, don't stand there sulking, miss. Go and find it. Where do I find the heart of England? In the window, it's stifling. There's a balcony. Oh. Is it any cooler out there? A little. <laughs> There's a breeze. Lots of smells. Mm. Doesn't smell like England at all. Ah. What? There's a ceiling fan. Like being in one of those Yankee films with Charles Boyer and Marlena Dietrich, all scorching sands. And scorching passion? Take care. You have come to a land of fire, <laughs> and you are made of fire, my dear. Oh, you're an idiot, <laughs> Eric. I am a fool. A fool who loves you to distraction. Darling, you're a fool who booked us into the Hotel Continental, which just happened to be a brothel. I didn't notice a thing until I pointed out the whores and their customers. Some of them were quite pretty. In a boyish kind of way? Mm. Actually, I wonder if some of them were boys. Some of them were dirty, unwashed. You were, uh, you could. I'm not sure Actually, this place is much better. But the Majestic is much better than the Continental. Shall we go out? Let's see if we can find a cafe. I do, I do, though. What? Love you. <laughs> Spain taught me that. You married me before, Spain. You know I loved you then, but... I didn't know you. No one really knows anyone else unless they have years together or things, events, make them speed up. Do you see? I'm not sure I do. Is it getting cooler? After an attack on the Zaragoza front once, we were retreating, carrying anything we could scavenge from the fascist lines, and they began shooting and rolling grenades down the hill. I was, I was mud-caked, sore, dog-tired, and carrying a 60-pound ammunition box. There was no way I could run, but I got up and ran. War does that to you. It accelerates everything. I know. I corrected the proofs of Catalonia. I read the story a dozen times. <laughs> It is cooler. I definitely need a cup of coffee. You see, without you to hold on to, I would have died from the wound. And I think now, without you... You get by, Eric. You always do. 
But it is sweet of you to say it, I think. I mean it. It's the only thing I do mean at the moment. Then you know what I want, Eric. You're right. We do need a coffee. to drink too much of this stuff, I should think it would send you a bit doolally. <coughs> it doesn't seem to bother people. Not unless they're mad already. Do you see how the French still lord it everywhere? But aren't they just being French? Or imperialist. I saw it in Burma. It's probably the same in India. It would probably be the same on Mars if we could get there. Let us bring you the benefits of European culture. Here, the cash nexus. There, let's create a servant class, some downtrodden workers. Oh. But you don't think so. Did you know Cecil Rhodes once said I'd annex the solar system if I could? Oh, and on Public top Public meeting. <clears throat> That's rather good, actually. <laughs> that was awful, wasn't it? The way they turned on me. At Conway Hall. The way you wanted them to turn on you. Well, at least they'd read the book. Actually, given the sales, they were probably the only people who had. And the flies have gone. Hmm? We hadn't noticed. I think they've adjourned to a better venue. Oh. It's, it, it is very strong, isn't it, and sweet? The funeral, you see. The landing on the body as they carry it. Muslim funerals, you, you, you must be buried before nightfall, I think. Oh, and they drink the... The funeral coffee, bitter, without any sugar at all. And so if you hadn't down the cup of bitterness to the dregs before you die, your friends do it for you. How charming. Darling? I want a child. I'm a woman. I want a child. I want us to have a child. We've tried. You know that. You can't have children. You don't know it's me, Eric. But we could adopt. All right. <laughs> Granted, we could, but look at our finances. I've got about £50 pounds in the bank. I owe over 300 A child isn't an economic transaction. Marx would disagree. Marx was a thwarted rabbi who hated God and most people. Apart from his daughter and Engels. Marx used Engels. Marx used everyone, just like you do, Eric. I don't believe that's true. Prove it, then. We didn't come here to talk about children. Not for my health, either. Not just for my health. No. Oh, the flies are back, more than ever. Are we going to say it or not? We're here for Georges Cop because... because we ran out on him in Barcelona. And now he's free, and... Ran out I... on him. It's a Yankee expression. It makes us sound like Stop gangsters. Stop it. Who cares what we sound like? We deserted him. We saved our own skins, and now... All right. You look a bit... It's just the flies. That's all. They're hateful. What does Mark say about them? They're, they're useful, because... We deserted your lover. Is that what you think? Hmm? And we didn't. We did all we could. It wasn't very much, was it? Oh, there's no point in talking this way. <sighs> I need to go back to the hotel. I... I need a doctor. I don't feel well, Eric. I think I'm, I think I'm sick. I, and if you tell me that in England we say unwell, I'll tip my bloody coffee all over your sanctimonious self-pitying. Monsieur, uh, l'audition. Combien je vous dois, docteur? On réglera ça plus tard. Au revoir, monsieur. Madame. Je vous enverrai l'infirmière. Merci. I am sorry, darling. I'd rather gone and ruined it all, haven't I? No, you haven't done a thing, except play host, well, hostess to some virus or other. Yes. Well, the doctor says you'll be up and about in a couple of days. I feel awful. Those flies, I keep hearing the flies buzzing and buzzing and buzzing. Mm -hmm. like, that, that, like that dreadful meeting. Oh, it doesn't matter now, it doesn't matter now. You must rest, make yourself better, and I'll find a place near the mountains where the air's cooler, you'll see. We'll be all right, won't we, Eric? Of course we will. Well, you'll, you'll write another book, and maybe this one will sell, and uh, we'll be all right. I could write a hundred books, darling, but none of them would be... none of them would be worth a damn. 
I could go through the motions, I could... It'd all be rubbish. No. Someone once said to me when I was tramping, the trouble with you, mate, is you're as crooked as a nine-bob note. I was a fake. A fraud is what he meant, and anything I write now, you see, is a fake. It's a fraud. I'm not a good man. Not even a very nice man. I've done discreditable things. I've, what did you say earlier, used people. Yeah. <coughs> What's worse, I've... I've used people I love just the same as those I despise. I, I, th I think I've done good work, a little. But do you know there's nothing worth a single damn that I've ever written that hasn't been about politics in one way or another. That's, that's what I am. That's what excuses all the rest, if it ever can be excused. I am not about anything that isn't political. And now I'm not even that. <laughs> now I haven't even noticed that my wife has been asleep for five minutes, hasn't heard a single one of my hugely important vital epochal thoughts. I heard everything, Eric. I always do. Now you must go. You have to meet George. Can't he wait for one night? Hmm? I could send a message. He's been in a communist prison for almost 18 months. God knows what they've done to him. You go, Eric. You have to go now. And remember, he was your friend. He is your friend. I should wait until the nurse arrives. Go. Now, Marcus Aurelius once said, what are we in the end except our jobs? Do you want me to get up and throw you out? Anyway, wasn't Aurelius a gloomy old bugger? Um. Oh, yes, I see. Now go. Monsieur. Ah, uh, uh, je cherche uh, Monsieur Georges Cop. C'est ici notre rendez-vous. Monsieur, Monsieur Cop m'a demandé de vous dire qui sera sur la terrasse. Ah, merci. Uh, monsieur, la terrasse c'est pas là. Do you mind if I join you? Hola, comrade. Oh, it's good to see you. <coughs> yes. <laughs> you still don't like being hugged, do you, Eric? I don't really like being touched, on the whole. Uh, I don't. It's good to see you. Alive. Here. No, uh, that's wrong. Where else would you be except the best hotel in town? I'm a Marxist. Where else would I stay? <coughs> I've never seen the need to punish myself for anything. Yes. After all, there are always one's comrades to do that. Sit. Have some wine, or would you prefer something stronger? You look tired. Uh, it, it's nothing. Eileen is... She, she has a fever. She sends her apologies. What did you mean, comrades? Comrades? Mm. Don't be disingenuous, George. I know you. We've been under fire together. Damn it, you, you slept with my wife. Is that what Eileen says? You know it isn't, because she would never speak in that manner. Because she couldn't, or out of some kind of loyalty? I notice you don't say out of love. What do you think of the wine? Hmm? It's filthy. Filthy like everything else in this damned country. <laughs> if you ever needed to know how capitalism and tourism can destroy a culture, come to Marrakesh. Starving jackals leering at tasty, plump meat pies walking round all day. You know, yeah, I I'm surprised they don't eat people here. Snatch meaty Germans, uh, tasty Swedes, garlicky frogs off the streets. And what about stringy Englishmen? Mm, stringy Englishmen, yes, that's good. Uh, marinated with, with uh, black tobacco. Not a very tasty prospect, I think. <laughs> Eric, I will never, ever say a word about my relationship with Eileen beyond this simple fact. I love you both. I'm not sure you love anybody, though there are those you respect or respected in Spain and elsewhere, but Eileen has a great heart. To say any more would be to dishonor us all. And a Belgian would never do that? 
You are still a Belgian. Did I ever say I was Belgian? I think I said I lived there, yes, for a while. Is it possible to trust a single word you say? Perhaps it is not quite the time for that much honesty between us. We fought together on the Zaragoza front. We could have died together. Doesn't that at least mean anything? It means a very great deal, my comrade. <coughs> Far more than perhaps you understand. Don't go all cow-eyed and mystical on me, Georges. <laughs> oh, I am a practical man. I have ideas, you know, for many inventions. To help humanity. And to make a little money, too. Mm. The laborer is worthy of his hire. Uh, a washing machine, for instance. Is that any use? Think of the time it would save for millions of women. Uh, well, I, I suppose so. What else would they do? Uh, you are such an Englishman. They would become communists and rise up and create a new world. As we did in Spain. Perhaps we were the necessary sacrifice. Have you ever thought of that? No. Perhaps... Stalin and the Comintern boys were right. Revolution in Spain, land and freedom, doesn't really matter in the face of the threat from Germany. It is vital there should be a united front against fascism. Who is not my enemy is my friend. <laughs> Does that mean anything at all? I remember you asked me that in Barcelona as the communists were rounding us up and putting us in prison. And do you remember what I answered? it could mean anything they chose to make it mean the last time we saw you in that jail you asked me to tell them tell them what happened here in Barcelona in the days of May 1937 when good men and women were betrayed by those they believed to be their comrades yes. <coughs> I did that you see I wrote the book and almost no one read it, and the few who did shouted me down and called me traitor. <coughs> all of us, the, 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 the anarchists and the Trotskyists and all those who died on the Zaragoza front called us traitors and, and, and collaborators. You, Georges, they said it of you and they still say it. The, the left-wing press, before we left England, published articles, dates, uh, times, documents, witnesses. Men we knew and trusted who stood up and swore you were Franco's agent. Are you saying that was necessary because the party says we need a united front against fascism? Perhaps what is, is not always what we wish it to be. <laughs> that would be fighting for... for clockwork, Georges. Perhaps we live in a clockwork world. Because clockwork doesn't bleed? Well, I do. And bruise and weep and... Pain is a very effective tool. I've learned that. The human body is almost infinitely vulnerable and yet possesses quite amazing powers of endurance. What happened to you when they... in prison? What happened there, George? Uh, you know, Eileen thinks we let you down. We should have tried harder to get you out of that prison. In that, your wife is wrong. Perhaps she lets her feelings rule her heart in the matter. Well, I honor her for it, but... There... There, I found a new world. Or perhaps rediscovered it. A world where the heart no longer exists. And at the center is... You are right, of course, Eric, as you so often are. Only clockwork. Tell me. Yes. But not here. Come. We'll find somewhere better. Where are we? In the city. Where else? The real city, in a way, if there still is one. Uh, garçon, de café, s'il vous plaît. Like Barcelona in the early days. A city of the people. Yeah. Truly of the people. You remember it, Eric. Of course you do. The sense that for the first time in history, here was... A city where the working class was in the saddle. You could see it at once. And see that it was worth fighting for. Yes. Come, let's see it. Like 
Barcelona in May, where the waiters called you sir again instead of comrade, where the secret police cruised the streets and arrested enemies of the people who just risked their lives fighting for the people. Ah, the people had changed. It happens. Smoke? I try one of these. Thank you. You never used to roll your own, George? A habit I picked up in prison where tobacco was scarce. What is this? A local strain. You'll find it interesting, I'm sure. <coughs> I used to find everything interesting. Now I find it hard to care about anything. I don't think that's true. Even so? Even so. You want to know what happened? Did they... In the end, of course they did. It's what they do. I think they would, even if there was no possible need for it. Uh, merci. People have told stories around here in these cafes, these streets out under these stars for as long as there have been stories to tell. I think it was here that literature first came into our world. From people who tried to make sense of their world under these stars, drinking thick, sweet coffee. You should have been the writer. Then you could have been paid to lie. It takes more than money to make a good liar. Shall I tell you a story? Is it a true story? As true as the pain from a wooden stave smashed into your elbow repeatedly. Believe me, it gets the attention. Pain has a way, as you know, of holding the floor at these meetings. I think I'm forgetting what it was like. I pray you never get reacquainted. After you saw me at the Falcon Hotel after I'd been arrested by the communist militias. They kept us there for weeks, waiting. It does something to you, waiting without knowing. Will they let me go? Will I be tried? If so, for what? Will they question me? Let a man get hungry, run down, listless. Then wake him up very early one morning and take him somewhere else. Do you see what I mean? In a truck, not knowing where you're going, where you are beyond the fact that you're in a cell and you think, how can they find in these times one cell for me alone? Am I special in some way that I've been given this space? You were in solitary confinement. Being alone is not good for us, Eric. We turn inwards on ourselves. We become uh, inward grown. Is that the expression? Ingrown, like a nail growing back into the skin. Exactly. In the end, I was even happy to see my interrogator. Well, for a few minutes. What did they want from you? Ah, everything. He was a Russian, uh, a man from Moscow. I thought, goodness me, they've sent in the checker. They must think I'm important. That was my mistake. I was nothing. The same interrogator would handle a street sweeper from Cadiz, a shepherd from the backlands. It was made very clear to me that I was nothing and no one and might vanish in a moment like a speck of dust. If he was Russian, he... Did not know I could speak the language. That was his mistake. He had tried to speak through a translator. They wanted me to admit my crimes. No, oh, simple stuff. Being part of a fascist cabal, being a wrecker, aiding Trotskyist infiltrators, poisoning the water, releasing deadly gas at communist party meetings. Anything, really. It's, it's, it's absurd, all of it. Fifteen, sometimes eighteen hours a day, day after day. Your crimes are obvious, cop. You know what you did. What did I do? You know what you did. Bang, bang, admit it. What did I do? You know what you did. Did you sign anything? I'm sure I would have done. Anyone would. Oh, there were times I would have signed my mother's death warrant. Actually, there were times I would have done that while standing at the Ritz. But, yes, I would have signed. Anyone would. It's human. You can only bear so much. But that was no good, because in my heart, I would have known it was a lie. And they knew it, too. That's the secret, Eric. You don't accuse a man with facts and dates and witnesses, no. You simply accuse him and allow the man himself to build up the story from within. Because only in that way will he come to believe in his heart in the absolute truth of the charge. And then, of course, he will begin to accuse those whose participation supports his guilt as he must or everything is lost. You, Eileen, many of our comrades. What happened, George, in the end? In the end, I think I was saved from the worst because uh, this was sound strange. Because of the simple fact my interrogator could not speak 
directly to me, so he believed, but had to pass everything through an interpreter. He spoke in Russian. I answered in French or even English sometimes. If, do you see, if he had controlled the language as well as the room, then it would have been as if he owned my thoughts. And there would have been nothing to stop him reaching into my mind and doing anything he chose. Who owns the word owns the world? It's no chance that the fascists and communists use language to force people into thinking exactly as they want. It's, it's perfect. Did anyone ever, before our time, even contemplate stealing a whole language? It's a long time since I saw you laugh, my dear comrade. <laughs> well, it's, it's a long time since there was anything to laugh about. <laughs> Only it's not really very funny. <laughs> Who steals the language steals my words. I have nothing left to speak with except a, a criminal tongue. Is there food? I'm rather hungry. Garçon, peut-être en place de ma moule. The interrogation stopped? They left you alone? No. They simply tried a different method. There was a coal bunker in the yard of the prison. Cramped, windowless, icy at night, burning in the day. Perpetual dark, rotting food. And worse. They put me in there, gave me bread, a little stale water, and left me to the rats. Rats? I swear I thought they would eat me alive. This carpet, this... this stink of rats. Have you ever smelled it so thickly you could taste it? Endlessly running. I couldn't stand without bending, but I stood for days and nights as they ran. And then, afterwards I found it was only twelve days, someone shouted down, We're taking you out tonight. To shoot you. I hate rats. Everyone hates rats. Even the god of rats hates rats. That's why they're rats. But they did not shoot me. And after that, I was moved from camp to camp. I know that outside... Your friends were working for you. If not then, perhaps I would still be there. But they let me go one day for no more reason than they arrested me. And here I am. Uh, merci. Are you all right? Not feeling ill? No, it's... It's the rats, that's all. How could you stand it, George? Well, for one thing, I may hate rats, but I don't fear them. Uh, now, if it had been... Uh, but perhaps I shall not tell you what I fear most. Joe, if you could find that for each man, you'd have the key to everything. Is it late? I really should be back. Eileen... Uh, the kiff changes your sense of time. Though, on the whole, I think it is benign. Then maybe you can show me where to go now. How to speak in a language I no longer own. You worry too much, Eric. Here, take the smoke deep. Thank you. My lungs aren't really made for deep anymore. <laughs> Taste is, is not unpleasant. I believe Hassan al-Sabah, the founder of the Order of Assassins in the 13th century, used to give his followers something similar. They would smoke and wake in a beautiful garden and then sleep. And when they woke, the old man of the mountains, as he was known, would tell them they had seen paradise. England's the only garden I ever wanted. Going back to it. After Burma, after Spain, it always somehow soothed my soul. Men are like flowers in the garden that stand and grow where the gardener hath planted them. They have upon each of them the dew of heaven, which being shaken by the wind, they let fall their dew at each other's roots, whereby they are jointly nourished and become nourishers of one another. You are a gardener? 
Always have been. That's not me, though. That's, um, that's John Bunyan. Good man of Bedford. He was a prisoner. I'm certain he was a gardener, too. Was he a Marxist, this Bunyan? <laughs> he was a dreamer. You know, George, I once walked England on the tramp with this maiden, that. And as we walked... Come on, wake up. I'm wet. Did it rain? Just a do. You're covered with snail tracks. They must like you. Is that, uh, is that good fortune or something? No, nope, just means they like you. If snails likes anything other than green leaves. But he hated snails, my dad. Your dad? Gardener he was. Veg and stuff. Snails and slugs, see? Gardener's enemy. Oh, it's a fine morning. Do you want some water? I want a cup of char, that's what I want. Come on, let's get going. I knows a place where they'll give us char and a wad if we're lucky. Here, roll some butts. That'll set you up. Do you know a place for everything, Tommy? Except salvation. Do you want salvation? It's harder for the likes of you, I reckon. <coughs> Some of us, we was born for it. Did you never have a job, Tommy? Oh, I was in the war. I joined up at 16, I did. 1917. Saw so whole regiments who wouldn't fight no more. They never told you that, did they? You ask me. The Yanks hadn't have come in. We'd have lost. <laughs> I was a boxer in the army. Yes. Middleweight. I had a future, I reckon, till I got the gas. Couldn't last out but three rounds after that. Lungs gone to glory. Only place they fight three rounds, you know. Booth fighter at the fairground. Twenty fights a night. Pay a tanner, get a bob if you stay on your feet against the pro. <laughs> that was me. Half a crown if you flaws the fighter. Never happened, of course. <laughs> But after a few years, well, the only thing I could see was straight road pilgrim. And being outdoors, loved that I did. Oh, I do. A, a fella can breathe out there. You won't be able to do it forever, Tommy. Sufficient unto the day. Isn't that it? <laughs> the flowers don't flog themselves to make a penny, and neither does Tommy Cook. I and one day they'll find me dead under a hedge, and you know what, Pilgrim? I hopes they leave me there a rot. That'd suit me just fine. Do you believe in life after death? <laughs> My horse, but you've got a lot of questions, ain't you, Pilgrim? I know you never get tired of asking stuff. Well, I only want to know what you think, what it's like for you, Tommy. Aye, well, most folk don't. I'll give you that, but I'll tell you something more. Mm -hmm. Most folk, on the road at least, don't go asking. Eh? They, they leave a white to itself. If he want you to know, he'll tell you. That's why fields have hedges, ain't it now? Didn't farmers make hedges to keep people off the land? <laughs> if that's all you know, Pilgrim, then you don't know much. Huh? Look at it. Eh? You think someone made it? And all the things that live in it? Listen. Sorry. Come closer. Yes. Shrews running through the dry leaves. Huh? You'll never see them, but you can hear them. They grew. Air pilgrim. The hedges, the fields, the trees. <laughs> oh, some white may have planted them one time, but they did the growing. They made themselves what they is, and... Well, you, you might come along and plat the edge. You see, they've done it there. It's only a haircut and it goes on growing. <laughs> if I had to, I could live off what's in the hedge for six months. You all right there? Yes, I, I, um, I just have to sit down for a while, Tommy. I, that's all. I'm tired, just tired, but I'll be fine in a while. Yeah, of course you will. <laughs> 
Everything needs a rest. That's why we have winter, isn't it? And it's time to start growing again, because we'd all be in the shite, it wasn't, eh? Uh, uh, you go on. I'll, I'll be with you in a while. Well, I'll get that cupper and a nice wad set up for us, eh? Yes. Why don't we leave you some back, eh? No, it's fine. It's all, it's all, it's all fine. Aye, well, well, look after yourself, Pilgrim, because no other bugger will, eh? <laughs> Hmm? Were you sitting up all night? I, um... <coughs> you, you were? No, no. I, I'm afraid I went to sleep. I, I don't think the nurse came. No, you were there. I remember. I must have woken. I, I saw you. I was glad you were there. I was glad I wasn't alone. How do you feel? Is there some water? I'm, I'm parched. Yes, yes, of course. Uh-oh. Um, Clean. Drink this. Ah, oh, it's better. Yes. I feel drained, but me. I feel like me. More, please. I was thinking about George's letter, about what he describes, the, the interrogation, the rats, all of it. I think we should go to Paris and see him. <laughs> or at least invite him to come to England to stay with us. You don't feel we let him down anymore? I think we did all we could under the circumstances. What about you? I... I walked through the wilderness of this world and I lighted on a certain place and I laid me down in that place to sleep and as I slept, I dreamed and behold... I saw a man clothed with rags standing with his face from his own house, a book in his hand and a great burden upon his back. I looked and saw him open the book and read therein. Pilgrim's Progress? I don't understand. Do you see, darling, you can't impose socialism on people or steal their words from out their mouths. You have to let it grow from the soil, from the people and their character. That's what an English socialism means. That's what Catalonia meant. Maybe that's what Trotsky means. I, I don't know, but I believe. I hope George understood that in his way. And, and I think I'm beginning to understand what I have to do. Yes. What? I think... I'm beginning to understand what I have to do. But if I was beginning to glimpse the road ahead, there were still many miles of the road Eileen and I had walked together that I did not understand. I did not know how we had come to be where we were, or how together we might arrive at our destination. In the real George Orwell, Dreaming... Eric Blair was played by Joseph Milson, Eileen Blair by Lindsay Marshall, Georges Kopp by Ewan Bailey, and Tommy by Paul Stonehouse, with Ben Crow and Will Howard. The Real George Orwell, Dreaming, was written by Mike Walker and directed by Jeremy Mortimer. <laughs>